morning, First Baptist. So glad to have you with us. We invite you to stand and sing along with us wherever you are this morning. We want to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enjoy the freedom that we have through him of our sins. Let's sing together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my shame till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my truth till I met you. You called my name. precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him 
and all my love is to him. He plants me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me. Beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his name. strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow And melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow.
has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me, who the Son sets free, oh, is free. There's a place.
morning, Summerfield family. Uh, so glad to be with you. You're probably looking and saying, wow, where are they at? We're going to get that in just a moment. We are in a different place uh, today. And I love being in different places, by the way. Uh, this, you know, this series, we're, we're coming to the end of it. Uh, and I've sort of titled this end uh, of it, uh, Observations in the Midst of Chaos. We're in COVID-19. Uh, we've been in a family series, Building Godly Homes. Uh, but this series is special to me for multiple reasons. Uh, first and foremost is the passion I have for my own family uh, to live out the gospel and to, and to have a godly home that represents and honors him. Uh, the second passion and sort of the reason it's special to me is uh, my passion to see other families uh, do exactly the same, live out the gospel and build their, their homes uh, in a godly manner that impacts the kingdom. And, and the third passion that I have is sort of the reason we're in this room is the passion to stand in the gap uh, for those families that may be in a troubled season. I, I want to ask Eric if he just share with you exactly where we are right now. Yeah, so we're in the Parent Resource Center here in the church. Uh, something we started uh, last May, and Eric and Megan Calloway do an amazing job with it. Some of you have been in here for some parenting seminars. Uh, this is where we have resources for our parents. We want to help equip our parents. Uh, Eric helps us with this also. We want to help equip our parents what, um, how to make disciples of their students or their children so that they can be disciple makers also. And so we've got some of the resources here up behind us. We've got some other ones in the room, and we're going to talk a little bit more about these resources and how they can help you uh, as we kind of go through this. Thanks, Eric. Uh, you know, when we were praying, uh, Eric and I met, we were praying, on how do we finish this series uh, in, in a very practical way to give tools? And the, and the Lord sort of told us both the same thing, is we need to give the foundation on which to build on, the Lord Jesus Christ, and then give some practical applicational tools uh, to start the building with the families. And so... Um, you know, that's why we're in the parent resource room. You know, the, the, the text this morning, uh, and I won't ask you to stand this morning because it's short as well as uh, I don't want to knock these books over uh, when I stand up. So, uh, but there's a text that uh, sort of brought to my attention uh, exactly what we wanted to convey and what God, I believe, wants to finish up this series on. And that is if, in Psalm 11, 3. It says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? What can the righteous do when the foundations are being destroyed? Right now, our society is trying to destroy uh, the foundation, uh, the family. Uh, and so what can we do as the righteous uh, when the foundations are being destroyed? And I believe God has given us what we can do and what we need to be building on in this series. And so the simple takeaway this morning, and I'm going to pray, and we're going to really dive in and give you some of these practical tools. But the simple takeaway that I want you to remember for the whole series, really, it's simply this, God desires our lives and our families to be built on the Lord Jesus Christ. He desires our lives and our families to be built on the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you pray with me this morning, and then we're going to dive into some practical tools on how you can get started building your godly home. Father, we do come to you, Lord. God, we thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you uh, for what you've already done in this series in some homes. I, I thank you, Lord, for working in the hearts of people. And, and in that, homes are changing. They're being transformed for the glory of God. And Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, as we sort of finish up this series with some practical applicational tools this morning, Lord, I just hope and pray that you, as you continue to encourage and challenge families, Lord, I pray that they would be encouraged. And as we come out of this in the midst of some chaos, that there would be stronger homes for the glory of God. We pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, there's several things uh, this morning that we're going to discuss when it comes to building a godly home and sort of these practical things to think about. The first one uh, that really uh, sort of sets the tone is the dedication to marriage. We haven't talked a lot about marriage in this series, but it certainly is critical when it comes to building a godly home, is the dedication to marriage. And I draw back to the text that we used last week uh, for that, the commitment that's there in Psalm 128 and, and involving the whole family. You know, when you blow up the family, I heard a preacher say this one time, when you blow up the family, you blow up the whole culture. When you blow up the family, you blow up the very fabric of society. And so well, we see that in God's order, really. I mean, when you look at it, before he created the nations, before he even created the nation of Israel, before he even created and instituted the church, uh, in God's order, he established the very first institution in the family back in the Garden of Eden. He established the home first. And when you think about that, the family uh, is the foundation of any civilization. 
Uh, it's really not history. It's, it's not education. It's not military. It's not um, the economy. It's not business or commerce uh, that establishes the foundation. The foundation of any civilization is really the family. And in that, the marriage is the foundation of the family. So when you start thinking about the dedication of the family, some of the observations, I told you there's going to be some observations on this series as well as what we're uh, battling right now in this pandemic of, of trying to relate uh, to one another in the middle of a very chaotic time. And some observations during this COVID-19 specifically to marriages. You know, many marriages, I believe, have been impacted both positively and, and, and potentially some negatively in some manner. But I re really believe that what I've observed in the families that Tammy and I have uh, strong relationships with, what I've observed is that some families that Tammy and I have those relations with, this pandemic has actually brought them closer together from a marital standpoint. Uh, there's been more com communication and not just more communication, uh, but there's been better communication. Uh, there's been more encouraging words being said to each other. There's more inter uninterrupted time together and uh, just more time for that particular essential part of the family, the marriage relationship. And, and with that, um, you know, I've got a couple of books and I want to turn it to Eric as well. But in thinking about this communication, one book in particular, The Five Love Languages, many of you have probably seen this book. Uh, over the years is still one of my favorite books. When you're communicating, this book gives you, you need to be communicating the love language to your spouse that they're going to receive the best. Uh, and then the, the, another book that comes to my mind when I start thinking about men and their role and responsibility in the marriage is Tony Evans' Kingdom Man. That's two books that I uh, would certainly suggest from a practical application uh, that you use. And Eric, I know you've got a couple of things that you yeah, want so to share as well. Dr. Rob Reno, uh, writes a book called God's Grand Vision for the Home. And he's also got two other books called Visionary Parenting and Visionary Marriage. Mm -hmm. And really what he talks about is just having this kingdom vision for the family. The idea that when you're uh, looking to influence your child or you're looking to disciple your child, uh, you really have to think about it from the standpoint of I'm discipling my grandchild or my great-grandchild. Mm -hmm. And so what is the influence I'm having two generations down the line? Because what I'm doing right now is going to affect yeah that legacy. And, um, you know, Rob and, and his wife talk about how the idea that God's vision for the home is that we would lead all of the children to him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can't necessarily control three generations from now or four or five generations from now, but we can do our best right now um, to, to influence our children and influence our home. And, and I think that the number one resource, which I know you would agree would, would be this right here. Um, yes. You know, LifeWay shows that Bible engagement is is the number one spiritual discipline that leads to every other discipline. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of times we have questions about, well, how, how do we do this or, or how do we do that? And uh, there's certainly books and resources like this that we're going to reference that help flesh some of this out. But the, yeah. the Bible is kind of the foundation. It's yes. kind of the root of what yeah. gives us the starting point, yeah. the, the standard for which we can measure yeah. uh, what we're doing and, and, and why and how, we, how we're doing it. Yeah. Good deal. Good deal. You see, you can see there's some... Very practical uh, tools here to help you be able to begin uh, if you're married. Uh, all of us can be better at marriage. Amen? All of us can be better Amen. At, at marriage. Uh, I wrote a couple of statements down uh, concerning this, uh, this principle. Strong families are born at the marriage altar. Strong families are born at the marriage altar, and they continue to grow in the crucible of daily living and lifelong commitment to God to one another. Uh, marriage is not a promise. It's a covenant. It's much stronger than a promise. And so as you there uh, build your homes, uh, marriage is essential. A strong marriage will give you the ability to have that beginning of a strong home for the glory of God. Uh, and so the first, very first thing we, we see is a true dedication to marriage when it comes to building uh, godly homes. You know, the second thing that we want to talk about, not only a dedication to the marriage, but a second thing is certainly critical and foundational, uh, really above everything else, is a true devotion to the Lord. Uh, if you're going to have a godly home, if you're going to have a strong godly marriage, there's going to have to be a devotion 
to the Lord. And I'm pulling things back from all the, the, the series ser- and the sermons in the series. Uh, and the things that I thought about right off the bat from a devotion to the Lord uh, brought me right back to Deuteronomy 6, where we started this series, Deuteronomy 6, specifically in verses 5 through 6. And it, when it talked about loving the Lord uh, with all your heart, you've got to love him passionately. Uh, you've got to love him personally. That is with all your soul. Uh, you've got to love him practically. And that's with all your strength. And so a family must love the Lord. And, and they've got to love him in a manner that they love nothing else more. Uh, then they love him. And and then when I thought about a devotion to the Lord and having a godly home uh, for the Lord, it's going to involve that consecration, uh, that worship of God only. Uh, I drew back to my memory uh, on, I think it was the third sermon that we did uh, in Joshua 24, 14 and 15. Uh, I want to read those verses real uh, real quick for you to, to remind you of what loving the Lord looks like and only him being the center of, Uh, of your life. It says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Uh, Can I just say, family, you can't be faithful to the Lord and be faithful to all these other things in the world. Uh, There has to be a total focus, a total desire, a total worship for only him, because we see right in the next verse, it says, throw away the gods of your ancestors. Throw away the gods. I had underlined that in my Bible. Throw away the gods. What gods, little g's, are in your life right now hindering you from being truly devoted to the Lord. Uh, we've all got things in our lives that uh, become a little bit more important, increasingly more important uh, in our schedules, uh, in our time, uh, in, our, in our resources. Uh, I'm asking you today, I want you to identify those little gods, those things that are hindering you from being truly devoted, totally devoted to the Lord. You know, a critical part of loving the Lord is making sure you don't have any other gods around your heart. Uh, and so when I look at this, um, this, this particular part of worshiping only the Lord, uh, I'm drawn back to the statement H. and Rogers made when he said, God doesn't want a place in your life. He demands and deserves preeminence. God's throne is not a duplex. You know, godly men, godly women, godly kids, they all understand that God is to be worshiped alone that God is to be looked at as above. They, they look at the Lord as a sovereign ruler and authority over those their, their lives. And so when I look at these observations again, uh, from a COVID-19 standpoint, uh, the Lord stripped away, I believe, many of these little G's in lives. Uh, I think during this time, a lot of the things that has taken up calendars, schedules, potential resources, um, I think God is subtly, stripped them away, and in some cases, maybe extremely stripped them away. Um, I think God has a way of getting our attention, uh, even when it takes extreme ways uh, to do that. And, uh, you know, I want to push it back over to Eric, because there's some practical application and tools that that I think are are necessary and that we have available for you when it comes to this devotion to the Lord. Eric? Yes, I mean, I I think, uh, not being funny, but I mean, I I think it starts right here first. Uh, You know, Bible engagement (laughs) is, you know, leads to the other spiritual disciplines. You know, Mm -hmm. one of the things we teach the students is, you know, to have a daily quiet time, to have an active prayer life, uh, to serve others, Mm -hmm. uh, to meditate and memorize the word, um, and then share the gospel. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that studies show that when you start with a daily quiet time or with Bible engagement, uh, these things start flowing naturally. Mm-hmm. This active prayer life. Because if yeah. you're reading the Word, well, I want to talk to the person that I'm, I'm reading their letter, you know. And as I talk to God, you know, Psalm 37, 4 says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart. Well, you know, He desires to serve others. And that's the Son of Man didn't come to, to be served, but to serve. Absolutely. And and so we want to start serving others. And then as we serve others, questions come up. You know, that's for memorizing the Word and meditating on what it means. And then just naturally flows into sharing the gospel. And, and you know, I understand for, for some people, um, it's hard to, to start this discipline. It's hard to get into this. But we know that if we're going to make a home uh, that's creating disciples, um, then it starts in the Word. And, you know, one of the resources that we have here is actually a, a devotional piece called uh, Faith at Home, uh, Acts 239 Missional Families. And uh, Dr. Mark Smith at the convention, myself, and, and a couple others uh, helped write this and it's a seven week devotional and it's for, uh, it's for home. And the first week we put in it, uh, we wrote, uh, five days for the parents. I actually wrote five days for the parents on kind of, Hey, that starts with you. Um, cause we don't, 
expect you to walk into the room and lead your kids in a devotional mm -hmm. uh, if you've never done it yourself you because one, it'd be uncomfortable mm -hmm. and awkward. Um, but it's something that, uh, you know, we, we, we've offered a seminar on it before. Uh, we'd love to offer a seminar on it again. Um, not everybody gets it right. I'm sure you haven't gotten it right in your house all the time. I know that I don't get it right in my house all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but we got to keep coming back to the yeah. foundation and making yeah. sure that we show our kids that even in failure, Christ is still Lord. Yeah, He is. You know, and that's 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 a great statement. Even in failure, He's still He's still Lord. He still restores. Uh, you know, I wrote down uh, concerning this putting God uh, above everything else and stripping everything else away because He truly is God alone. Uh, there is no rival. There is no equal. I'm not going to start singing. I want to. Uh, but there, there is no rival. He has no equal. Uh, now and forever, our God reigns. Uh, and so his is the kingdom. His is the glory. And, and there's no name above the name of Jesus. And so we have to have a devotion only to Christ uh, if we're going to build uh, godly homes. You know, not only do we need a dedication to the marriage and devotion to the Lord, but the third thing we, we see, uh, we've talked about a, a lot over this series is a daily walk with Christ, uh, your daily walk with Christ. And, and, and it drew, drew me back to uh, the sermon last week in hitting the mark as a family because every family member needs to have and be committed to a daily walk uh, with the Lord. And uh, we, we sort of looked at Psalm 128 verses 3 through 4. Uh, and we talked about the wife being a fruitful vine uh, in her house and, and how uh, the kids would be like olive shoots around the table. Thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. Uh, you know, individually, we have to have a daily walk with the Lord. We have to be dedicated and devoted to a daily walk uh, with the Lord uh, because when we are, we, when we're committed to that daily walk, uh, it'll impact the rest of our day. It'll impact the rest of the week. It'll impact months and years if we have that individual daily walk, but not only just for the individual, uh, but I do think that there needs to be an intentional family daily walk, uh, whether it's, um, you know, a family devotion or just some time to talk about what God's doing uh, in the hearts of the people that reside in that in that home. Uh, this is essential uh, to building a godly home. And, you know, some of the observations that I've had throughout this uh, COVID-19 when it comes to families uh, I told you last week we were going to talk about uh, the dinner table, around the table a little bit more this week. One of the things, uh, especially in my home with my kids growing up, and Tammy would, would tell you the same thing, uh, we made it a priority to eat meals together and, and to eat meals together around the table with no TV on, with no, with no cell phones uh, uh, being looked at, no, no iPods, no gaming systems, nothing interrupted that family meal. Uh, and we made sure that we all were around uh, the table. Uh, it gave us a time to discuss what the day in school looked like for the kids, uh, the interaction, just to, to let them know we love them enough to care about what their day was like. Uh, it gave us a time to discuss what God's doing in their lives and maybe how they saw God in that particular day. Uh, around the table is a great place uh, when it comes to family devotions. And, and so when, when I think about the dinner table, uh, I know it's been often said the family that prays together stays together. Uh, I'll say this, the family that eats together stays together as well. You know, I, it's amazing to me uh, the shaping uh, of just something as simple as a meal around the table together as a family, how it has shaped my kids. Both, both of our kids uh, are grown and both of them are on their own and in their own place. Uh, but it, what's amazing to me is when they do come home for a visit or even when we go on vacation, but especially when they come home for a visit, uh, it's an expectation to them. They go, when are we going to eat? It's not that they say, well, I'm going to go over to my friend's house and we'll, I'll eat with them. There's an expectation because of the shaping and the molding that around the table and that dinner time and, and meal time had that it became an expectation in their lives. And so there's so much good stuff besides eating uh, that can happen good around the table. And, and another observation I had is walks together. Um, you know, this COVID-19 uh, has really, I believe, changed a lot of what's going on in families from a dynamic standpoint of, of people not being able to go into work, so they're having to work from home if they're still working. Um, but I'll tell you what I've seen uh, and observed, and Tammy and I were literally just talking about this uh, just a, a week or so ago. 
uh, I've been in the neighborhood, we've been in the neighborhood that we live in now uh, a little over four years. And I've seen more families walking together uh, and talking together on family walks in the last six or seven weeks than I've seen in the past four and a half years that we've been there. Um, you know, uh, even our neighborhood uh, did something uh, with kids being at home. Uh, if, if you would participate, they sent out this thing on the neighborhood app. If you would participate by putting a, stu a big stuffed animal in different windows in your house. And so families could go around and kids could sort of try to pick out which houses uh, had a stuffed animal or a bear or a monkey or whatever. We actually put a big monkey in Taylor's window and got Charlie Brown and Snoopy in one of the windows there. But uh, what's interesting is the fact that these families are taking walks together, uh, whether it's husband and wife only, uh, if their kids are gone like Tammy and I, or whether it's the whole family, there's walks together. And that's some of the observations I've seen when it comes to uh, having a daily walk with Christ. I know Eric's got a couple of things that he wanted to share concerning practical tools when it comes to a daily walk. Yeah, I think a, a big thing is that I, I hear when you talk is just intentionality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you were intentional about eating dinner. And I mean, that's the thing is being intentional about what we're trying to do at our house. When we get to eat dinner around the table, one of the things that we intentionally do is we have what's called the happy and crabby moment. Uh, you know, what's your happy uh, for the day? What's your crabby for the day? And then Brooke and I will try to work through that with them to understand that, you know, Christ is Lord in the happy and he's also Lord in the crabby. Mm -hmm. How can we turn that around and, and try to be intentional? And I think that's the key word is is intentionally doing something. You know, one of the things we have in here, one of the resources, we've done this study before, is by Doug and Kathy Fields. Uh, it's called Intentional Parenting, 10 Ways to Be an Exceptional Parent in a Quick Fix World. And the reason why I really like this study and, and why we've offered it before is because a lot of times when we think of, of parenting uh, from a discipleship perspective, we always think about just a Bible study. You know, I've got to do a quiet time, or I've got to do this, or I've got to do that. And that is absolutely the case. Um, but it's also, how am I walking with Christ in our discipline? Mm -hmm. How are we walking with Christ uh, in the failures, yeah. uh, whenever they disappoint us, mm -hmm. whenever they disappoint someone else, or they cheat, or they steal? Um, you know, how are we uh, acting in, in those? And so this is what this study is, is a really great study as far as being intentional about what you're doing. And then uh, just a reference, uh, Dr. Rob uh, Reno again, his book, Visionary Parenting, I know because some of our parents may be saying right now, well, that's great, but I don't have kids. You know, uh, kind of like maybe you and Tammy, you know, uh, our kids are out of the house. Um, you know, this is just what uh, Rob says he's, when he's talking about influence over children. He says the difference is that our influence, parents' influence over their hearts, it doesn't decrease with age. Mm -hmm. He says God has ordained parents with unsurpassed lifelong influence over the hearts of their children. And so an encouragement to our, our, our parents out there and even our grandparents and maybe great grandparents is that you're, uh, it's never too late to have influence over your child. I was at a conference one time uh, wrapping up after a Q&A and somebody had asked me the question that, you know, I really messed up with my kids. Um, you know, so my opportunity is just kind of gone. You know, I just don't have influence with them anymore. And I just asked them, I said, are you still breathing? And they kind of laughed at me and they mm -hmm. said, well, well, yes, I am. And I said, then you still have influence. Mm -hmm. And I said, the best way to start out with a grown adult is just say, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the amazing thing. But just being intentional yeah. about our walk with Christ. And as we pass that on to our kids yeah. um, and looking at our kids, I think intentionality is, yeah. is the key phrase. Yeah. Kind of maybe when I hang it up in our house, just be intentional. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, you, you make a good point. Uh, and I've always tried to remember this. Uh, as long as you're living, uh, if your mom and dad are alive, uh, you're still a child. Even when they die, you're still a child if you're living. Uh, you were born to two parents. Uh, and then also, uh, as long as you're living, if you had kids or if you've been influential over some kids' lives, mm. uh, you're parenting uh, to the day you die. Uh, so just because my kids are, are grown does not mean that I still don't have some influence and the ability to impact their lives uh, in a godly way from an influential standpoint. And so uh, I appreciate uh, you reminding me of that for sure. And so, uh, you know, when we think about a daily walk, again, it's essential to building uh, the godly home. You know, we, we talked about three things uh, so far. We've talked about a dedication to your marriage. We talked about a devotion to the Lord. Uh, we talked about a daily walk. And the fourth thing, uh, when you look at the summation of sort of building a godly home and, and what's required is there has to be discipleship in the family. There has to be an intentionality 
for you as parents to disciple your kids uh, for the Lord. Uh, and I, th- I thought about uh, back in the reference to, I think it was the first sermon in the series about a family must teach the Lord. We see that in Deuteronomy 7 through 9. I want to read that again to you um, as we think about this discipleship and training up uh, children. It says, Oppress and press upon them, impress them on your children. Uh, talk about them when you sit at home. Remember, this is the, the precepts, the truths, the, the scriptures, the, the, the commandments of the Lord. It talks about impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. That's pretty much all the time. Uh, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You know, if you're not sincere in your love for Christ, your kids will see it first and foremost. And so it goes back to that devotion and love for Christ. Uh, You've got to be sincere first yourself in your love and your commitment, your dedication, your devotion to the Lord because your kids are watching. And that's the first really practical way to teach them is allow them to see your actions and how your walk, daily walk with God impacts your life. Uh, That's really the first practical way to begin discipleship is just let them observe how God is working in your life. It's a starting point. Uh, shouldn't come as a surprise, uh, but it is a critical step we often miss. Uh, before we can pass on the Christian faith to our children, similar to what we talked about Lois and Eunice on Mother's Day, before we can pass on our Christian faith and what that looks like, uh, it must be within us first. And so when we look at that, we can't pass on something to them that we don't ourselves possess. And so we can't communicate that which we don't know ourselves. Uh, Parents are models. Uh, They're watching us, parents. Our kids are going to model and mirror uh, on uh, so many areas of life. They're going to model and mirror what they watch us do. And when we think about that, um, we have to understand the great responsibility behind that. It is our responsibility, God-given responsibility, to teach our kids about the Lord and what he has done in our lives to show that he is a living God living inside of us. Uh, And I I wrote down a a question in that first uh, week, and I'm going to ask it again. Will your love for the Lord be seen and heard by your kids in your life? Uh, Will your love for the Lord be seen and heard by your grandkids? Uh, Will your love for the Lord be seen and heard with all the people that you come in contact with. You know, when I think about the observations from a standpoint of discipleship uh, in this COVID-19 pandemic time and how the framework of the family is is being changed, uh, I believe for a positive. Uh, Another observation Tammy and I've had, uh, we talked about it a week or so ago as well, is little kids riding their bikes uh, all over the neighborhood. Uh, And that's something... You know, a lot of times we don't even see anymore as kids doing something as simple as getting outside and riding a bike. Uh, But something that really spoke to my heart as I was watching all these little kids ride their bikes, some of them still on training wheels too, um, is daddies and mamas walking alongside of them. And it spoke to my heart because I believe uh, teaching kids to stay in the right lane, teaching kids to stay upright um, in life, was a great illustration for me. Mamas and daddies walking beside their children, teaching them to sort of stay upright and in the right lane. Could it be, could it be the Lord is using this time for parents to share truth from the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, we talked about it, to help guide their kids' paths in life? Could it be that the simple reason for a pandemic that has affected the globe, could it be that this is given parents, stripped away all the things that take up our time in order to walk alongside their kids, teaching them to stay upright and in the right lane, God's lane, uh, during this time. Eric, I know you've got some things considering 
uh, discipleship that we, we can give to them practically tools that they can use. You know, I think one of the books we've got here is, is by Reggie Joyner and, and, and Christian Ivy. It's called Don't Miss It. Uh, parent every week like it counts. And so they wrote a book yeah. called uh, Just a Face. Mm -hmm. And kind of the, the, the coined phrase in there was, it's just a face, don't miss it. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of these things you can see over here um, behind me, and we have some on this wall over here, is just some of the things that we pick up through uh, the phases of life. Uh, you know, well, how we're going to disciple our kindergartner mm -hmm. is going to be different than how we're going to disciple an 11th grader. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kindergartners are not looking to answer the question why. Uh, they're looking to answer the question of, am I loved? Um, am I special? Uh, 11th graders and 12th graders and even 9th and 10th graders are, are looking for the question uh, more, why? Mm -hmm. Why should I believe this? You know, and some of the resources that we have for the different things is, you know, here's one for caught in between. Engage your preteen before they check out. You know, Terry, studies show that uh, kids are checking out of the faith as, as soon as fifth grade. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. when these kids graduate as seniors and they walk away from the church, it's when we've lost them, right? Uh, you know, we lost them six years ago. Um, they just kind of played the mm -hmm. game because they had to along the way. Wow. And, uh, you know, studies show that the church, for kids that are active, uh, that means kids are pretty much here all the time. We only have about 40 hours a year to influence them. Mm -hmm. uh, parents have 3,000. And uh, studies show over and over again, the number one influencer, the greatest earthly influence we have are parents. Uh, I don't know about you, but I know for me, even to this day, I don't necessarily agree with my parents all the time. Uh, but if they disagree with me, I take notice because they're my mom and dad. Um, and so another one we have, because I think this is a big deal, is parents are like, well, my kids are already out of the house. I've, I'm, I'm kind of gone. Like, I don't have a, an option. Uh, you know, a book here called 18 Plus, Parenting Your Emerging Adult. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you still have influence, even as they get older, yeah. to, to speak into their life. Um, you know, and so from a practical perspective, a lot of discipleship just involves getting them to do things with you. You're talking about riding bikes, uh, getting them to rake leaves for your neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, because when they're young, they just want to be like you. It starts out of that. I just want to be like mom or dad and rake leaves. Uh, you know, but as you speak into their life mm -hmm. and teach them that, no, it's about service, it's about mm -hmm. Christ. As they start getting older, it starts becoming to them. It's not just being about mom and dad. Yeah. It's like, no, I'm doing this because I serve other people. And, you know, I think a lot of parents sometimes feel like they can't do it. Um, and one of the apps that they have available that, that I use, even in my house, uh, and recommend is called Parent Q. Mm. Uh, so Parent, P-A-R-E-N-T-Q-C-U-E. -E. Uh, phenomenal app. It's got devotionals on it. It's got uh, inspiring quotes for kids. Uh, to speak into your kids, things not to forget, you know, as far as you're, you know, you know, fourth grader, hey, listen, this is where they're at right now. Don't miss it. Um, it's been very helpful to Brooke and I. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so I think the, the big thing is to remember the be with factor. Mm -hmm. uh, do things with your kids, even the monotonous things, yeah. and then talk to them about Christ in those yeah. moments and what that, what that looks like. Yeah. Um, so just that bonding moment. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You know, you, you reminded me of something when you were talking about uh, communicating what uh, they want to see or they're gonna what they see uh, you're gonna communicate uh, whether you love them or whether they feel loved uh, I want to say this uh, to every woman and every man right now uh, every mom every dad um, especially when it comes to this particular thing I I've heard this said many many times if you want your kids to know that they're loved Men, I'm speaking to you first. If you want to know, if you're, if you want your kids to know that you love them, love their mama. Love their mama. It will demonstrate to them that you love them. Same thing for you, ladies. You want your kids to know how much you love them. Love their daddy. Uh, it'll speak volumes in their life, uh, and it'll speak volumes that when you love them, even through the faults and the flaws, it's just a, another example of how the Lord Jesus Christ loves us. Even though we have flaws, we have things in our lives uh, that hinder us sometimes from seeing him clearly. So uh, there has to be an intentionality to discipleship in the family. You know, we've talked about being dedicated to your marriage. We've talked about a devotion to the Lord. Uh, we've talked about a daily walk. Uh, we just uh, spoke on discipleship in the family. Uh, the last thing that really uh, hit me in this series is simply deciding to follow deciding to follow. There's a choice in all of this. Everything that we've talked about, everything that we've given you here today, there will be a choice on what you do with what you've heard, and there'll be a choice on what you do with what you have available uh, to utilize. 
deciding to follow. I go back to the Joshua sermon, 24, 14 through 15. He says, you choose for yourself what you're going to do. Joshua said, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Uh, you know, I, I spoke about the word choose in that, that sermon. It, when you translate that word, uh, it always speaks of, very, of, a, of a very, very careful and well thought out choice and decision. Uh, that's what choosing means. It means you, you think about what the risks are if you don't choose this and what the reward is if you do choose this. Um, you know, in nearly every instance, that word is used in the Bible. It describes a choice that has ultimate and eternal significance. You know, uh, when I think about the families today, you know, the turmoil in our nation today can be traced back to the turmoil in our homes. Uh, if we want to see our nation turned around, we must start within our homes. Listen, you you can't see the needs that need to be changed. You cannot see what needs to be changed. You won't see that happen at the schoolhouse. You won't see it happen at the courthouse. You won't see it happen in the White House. It'll have to happen in our houses. It'll have to happen in your home. It'll have to happen in my home. So when I think about where we started out with this foundation, um, Psalm 11, 3 again, if the foundations are destroyed, and we know society and culture are trying to destroy the foundation of family. They're trying to redefine it. Uh, they're trying to uh, make it something that God uh, didn't create. And so what can we do as the church and as families that represent the kingdom of God when the foundations are being destroyed? Can I tell you, first and foremost, there's only one foundation that cannot be destroyed, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the foundation that cannot be destroyed. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 says, For there were, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid which is Christ Jesus. So today, families, you've got a choice. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff here, Eric. You have a choice. Yeah, uh, I think the big thing is is uh, for our parents and our church and our community, um, you know, we're committed to walking alongside you to help you be the disciple makers God's called you to be. I know uh, Derek uh, loves our children. Uh, we love our youth. Uh, Eric and Megan Calloway, the directors of the Parent Resource Center, uh, they love the next generation and they're here to help you to the best of their ability. Um, and so, you know, I'd encourage you to contact us, ask questions, let us come alongside and help you because we, we want to walk with you in this uh, and see Christ magnified in your home. That's good. That's good. You know, I want to close up with this. Uh, you know, we, we've talked about at the end of the day, when you look at building a godly home, when, when you think about being under construction right now, there's homes right now that's been under construction, some serious construction going on the last six weeks. Um, it really does boil down to what does the Bible say of what God desires and wants mm -hmm. in the family? And what does it say about his equipping and his, his doing of giving us the tools uh, to be able to do this? You know, I'm reminded of an article Peggy Noonan wrote in the Wall Street Journal um, several, a couple of years back. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Peggy Noonan is, she's a, she was a primary speech writer, special assistant to President Ronald Reagan from 1984 to 1986, and she's authored several books. So she comes sort of from a conservative worldview, certainly, when her writing. And she wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal a few days after the shooting uh, there at Park in Parkland, Florida, uh, a couple of years ago. And, and here's, here's what she wrote uh, concerning the family. Uh, interesting that she would talk about the family uh, in, a, in a shooting. Uh, she writes this, we all say it privately, but it's so obviously it's hardly worth saying. We, we've been swept away by social, technological, and cultural revolutions. Uh, see, the family blew up. When we look at the family blowing up, and we've seen the fabric of the family fraying for many years, whether it's divorce, whether it's unwed childbearing, whether it's fatherless sons, uh, and I'm just reading what she wrote here, fatherless daughters too, poor children with no one to love them. The, the internet's flourished, she says. Pornography has is run rampant and proliferated. Drugs, legal and illegal. Violent video games in which nameless people are eliminated and splattered all over the screen. The abortion regimes has settled in and with its fierce, endless, yet somehow casual talk 
about the right to end a life? An increasingly violent entertainment culture, low, hypersexualized, full of lawlessness. Speaking of the family. Family, we've got an opportunity right now in the midst of a very chaotic season to be still and know that God is still God and in control. And he created and established the very first institution in the family. And if he created it and it was important enough for him to be the very first institution established on this earth, then I just believe he loves us enough that he can change whatever needs to be changed in our homes, but it'll start when hearts change and turn back toward him. So as we think about this series and, and, and maybe how it's affected you, uh, I'm trusting a sovereign Lord. I believe this has been at a perfect time. I believe that he is speaking a perfect word. Uh, and I do believe that he is changing hearts. And in that, He's changing homes. Would you pray with me now as we continue to pray for the families of this church and all those families that may be watching that are not a part of Summerfield family? Uh, I want to pray for us right now. Father, we come before your throne, Lord, and we we, we thank you for this morning. We we thank you for a very practical uh, word from you, Lord. Lord, I'm, I'm drawn back to the very last thing. It begins with a choice. Lord, there may be someone within the sound of my voice right now that the very first choice that needs to be made is a choice to follow you as a believer in Christ. Uh, Lord, there may be someone right now going, I, I, I want to follow after the Lord because I'm not following him now. Matter of fact, I've never, I've never been saved. If you're struggling right now and you feel your heart being pricked by the Holy Spirit, if you are feeling that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are not saved. I want you to just simply say this prayer right now. The Lord wants to save you, but you've got to acknowledge and say, Lord, I've sinned against you. I've done wrong against a holy and righteous God. But Lord, I'm sorry and I'm repenting. I know that I've done wrong and I know that I need help, help that I cannot provide for myself, help that I cannot get from anybody else can only be helped by your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for me and shed his blood, that the very wrong things that I did could be covered and washed away, and that I could become one of yours, restored and adopted into your family. And I just want to ask the Lord to come into my heart and save me. If you said that prayer, we want to rejoice with you. I know I say it every week, and I'll say it every week that I preach because I do believe there needs to be a response to God's word and the very first response is you've got to be saved. But my heart tells me that there's probably many listening this morning that are saved but their homes do not represent what a godly home looks like. For those moms, those dads, those kids that are struggling right now, I want to encourage you. God loves you to see restoration. He wants to see that home changed for the glory of God. But it'll take a commitment first to just bow down before him and say, Lord, we've gotten it wrong. We come to you. We're asking you, Lord, to to restore, to bring back harmony within our home that only the Lord Jesus can bring, to bring back a peace beyond understanding in our home that only comes from the Lord Jesus. You need to pray right now that prayer because you home does not represent, doesn't resemble anything even close to the Lord and His peace and harmony. For this church family, we need to continue to pray for our families and to pray for the families around this community and beyond. We need to pray not only how we can speak into the hearts and lives of the people that are dear to us, that belong to this family, the Summerfield, but we need to be asking the Lord to give us a vision and give us uh, opportunities to, even in the midst of this chaos, to bring a very, just a resolve to it by literally just speaking the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ into people's lives, giving them a hope for their home 
giving them a hope that can change their hearts, that will eventually change their homes. God, we thank you right now for this series. I thank you for what you've done. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do with the families that have listened and have committed to do just what you've asked them to do, to build it all on the Lord Jesus Christ, to lay it all at his feet and say, I need help building my home. Lord, we love you and we thank you most of all for Jesus, who is the foundation for everything. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, he loved us enough to die for us so that we may live and not just live any old way, but have life abundantly. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you an update uh, concerning COVID-19 and our plans to reopen. And I got some exciting news. Uh, we are going to be uh, coming back in-house, uh, reopening on June the 7th uh, for worship. It will be in a little bit uh, limited capacity. And it's going to look a little different, uh, but we are excited. We can't wait to see you and your family. Uh, so just be in prayer as we begin the planning to have that happen on June the 7th. Looking forward to seeing you. Have a great rest of the week.